episode 175 of the world's favorite, yep, the world's favorite small business marketing show. Sit back and relax as the founder of Australia's largest online furniture retailer and third generation furniture designer shares exactly how he did it. Plus, I give a listener a bit of tough marketing love. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. G'day, motivated business owners everywhere. It is Timbo Reid here, and a very big well done to you for finding your way back inside the world that is lovingly referred to as the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Righto, let's get stuck right into some marketing gold because that's how we roll around here. You know, just this past few weeks, I've been trying to get in touch with the right person at one of those big social networks, you know, like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, blah, blah. My reason for contacting them was because I wanted to interview their leading small business marketing expert. Someone who could take you and I inside, behind the curtains, and share how to make best use of that particular social media channel. Yeah, love to. When do you want to do it? Was the response I was looking for. Yep, right. Who was I kidding? So firstly, I'm warmly introduced via an email from a very influential friend, by the way, to their local head honcho. I'm also given his mobile number. I call him and leave a message telling him who I am and the fact that I'd love to have a fireside chat with him. He responded saying he wasn't the best person to chat to and advised he'd just been told that the best contact is, here we go, press at fillinthegaps.com. They will be able to pass your request on to the most suitable contact, he says. No name, just a generic email address. And we all know where those puppies go. So I did. I emailed that mysterious press at email address. Since then, bagel, nothing, tumbleweeds, a big fat silence. Now I get the fact that these guys are busy, inundated with interview requests, maybe, I don't know, I assume so, but they're also inundated with money. I mean, their coffers are big, and I reckon they could afford to employ enough people to handle the demand that being popular creates. Now, this is not an isolated case. I hear stories of a lot of these social networks making it difficult to be contacted. Why? What happens when the gravy train slows and they need us? My point is this, though, team. I'm not here to bang on about how hard it is to contact the big guys. I'm here to remind us little guys and girls of the importance of being contactable and responsive. No matter what your size, make it easy. Make it easy for people to contact you. Have clear contact details on every page of your website, in your email signature, on your marketing collateral. Shout it from the nearest rooftop if you have to and respond in a timely manner. Even if it's just a quick, hey, got your email, I'll be back to you shortly. Simple, really. By the way, feel free to email me at tim at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com or leave your thoughts in the show notes of episode 175. I would love to hear from you, and I'll respond. Crazy, huh? All righty. Now, we have got an action-packed show for you today. I've got a fireside chat with the founder of Australia's number one, that would be largest, online furniture retailer in Milan Direct. I also give a New Zealand listener an answer to her marketing question she may not have been expecting. Plus, I share a recorded testimonial I received recently from a listener who's been motivated to start his own podcast. Oh, I love that when I move someone someone into a bit of podcasting action. But first, let me tell you about how our good friends at, you guessed it, Net Registry can help you crank out some great marketing. You know the online marketing world is full of acronyms. SEO, PPC, DNS, SEM. Seriously, as a small business owner, my advice is not to worry about them. But do worry about marketing your business online. It's kind of a mandatory these days. You see, motivated small business owners are running pay-per-click campaigns on Google, are optimizing their site for the search engines, do have secure website hosting, have great website design. 
Motivated small business owners are also not doing it all themselves. That's where Net Registry step in, team. Net Registry exists to get your marketing online sorted, or maybe even get your online marketing sorted. It's what they do. If you're not marketing your business online, then really, guys, you are leaving money on the table. Check them out, netregistry.com.au, and tell them Timbo sent you. Hey, also, lots of great feedback. Thank you so much, everyone, for your support of Swiftly, who came on as a sponsor in just last week's episode. More on them later. But now, let's get stuck in to Dean Ramler. Let's get him around the fire for a fireside chat. Dean is just 31 years old and has built a global online furniture retailing business that has sold, wait for it, more than 500,000 pieces of designer furniture to over 120,000 very happy customers. His business is Milan Direct. You may well have heard of it if you have li- if you are living in Australia. If you haven't heard of it and you are living in Australia, you're probably living under a rock. Quite a popular little brand, this. With a simple idea, Dean makes great design affordable and accessible to the masses. And that's what I love about it. He's got some beautiful design going and he's kind of made it accessible to us who do like a bit of design action in the lounge room or outdoors or wherever else in the home. Uh, It was launched in 2006 and he is cranking it out. He's actually a third generation furniture manufacturer and he's the first one to take the business online. He's going to take us behind the scenes as to how he did it, how he convinced the family more to the point and how he's built it to be the biggest online furniture retailer going around. Empty chairs at empty tables where my friends will meet no more. My background is in furniture. My family has been making furniture in Australia for over six years. And so I was brought up from a very young age, being taught by my granddad and my dad, all aspects and, you know, how to make the best quality furniture and through all the different marketing channels and all about business. And then uh, after my studies, I did my marketing business degrees, took a gap year off and started travelling all throughout Europe, but mainly in Italy, and I kept on going back through the Milan Central train station, because that's the central hub in Italy, uh, sorry, in Europe for all the trains, and it was when I was in Milan, I spotted, you know, this incredible furniture, and when I came back to Australia, caught up with a very good mate of mine from high school, Ruslan Kogan, who'd started Kogan Technologies probably, you know, 12 months prior, and yeah, we just got chatting over some pizza and $4 beers, and where, um, you know, I said to Ruslan, this is before Facebook, so we didn't actually, it's hard to communicate before Facebook, but I said, you know, what have you been up to the last 12 months? And he filled me in about, you know, he's making TVs in China, selling them on the internet direct to the public. And I'm like, that's really interesting because I've spotted this, you know, uh, trend of designer furniture over in Italy, and I've got experience in making furniture overseas and in Australia, and I want to, you know, do a similar thing. And we quickly, you know, it was just the idea just popped up just like that. I'm like, all right, well, why don't we use a similar business model that Ruslan had already used and but for furniture and, um, you know, pretty quickly Milan Direct got up and running. So um, just backpedalling, uh, your family, 60 years manufacturing furniture in Australia? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, uh, Retailers or wholesalers? Uh, a little bit of everything. Their, their business model has, they still operate in Australia today. Their model has constantly evolved. Um, my grandfather, when he came to Australia from Europe after the war in the you know, 1950s, um, set up a furniture manufacturing factory out in Cheltenham in Melbourne. And yeah, it was started making furniture um, for like Myers and selling it through their retail channel. Mm-hmm. Um, at one point, I think my grandfather was you know, responsible for making the most outdoor furniture in the country. Really? Um, yeah, which I've still got today. It's like the quality's lasted all this time. What, what was their um, retail brand, Dean? Uh, so it's my, my family's name, Ramler Furniture. Uh-huh. And today um, their business model has evolved and they do big contract furniture and are doing did the London Olympics, all the furniture for the Games, and they're now doing the Commonwealth Games in Scotland this year and now they just yeah, do major projects and not so much retail. Mate, that's a, uh, the London Olympics, not an insignificant contract. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, quite a big one. They did the Sydney Olympics too, which is what got them started on that contract part. Uh, I'm going to digress here. We will come back to Milan, but um, uh, keep it all in the family. Uh, <laughs> so, just to be clear, a small, well, clearly not small, a furniture manufacturer out of Cheltenham, Victoria, in Australia, did 
all the furniture for the London and Sydney Olympics or Athletes Village? What, what, what did they actually do? They definitely did all the Athletes Village. Mm-hmm. Um, also for the Melbourne Commonwealth Games going back to 2006. And at that point, I was working for my dad still. So I had the pleasure of for uh, nine months getting, it was something crazy like... Mm. 500,000 pieces of furniture into 23 venues across Victoria. So at one point, I spent three days inside the MCG fitting out 80 odd rooms in there, like, you know, chairs, tables, everything for the whole venue. So um, yeah, it was a really great project. And my family, like my brother, sister, uh, their partners all now work with my dad on these projects. So amazing. Yeah, time. Did, did you, um, so you grew up around furniture which kind of sounds weird because so did i but uh, i just sat on it but you yeah. like you, you did you did your passion then so as you're going around europe and keep going back to milan and seeing seeing this furniture is your passion about style and design is it about functionality is it about business a little bit of both like the business side comes from just being you know, in an entrepreneurial family we've all got a passion for that but as dorky and geeky as it sounds, we all do actually love furniture, you know. So whenever we'd go on family holidays and we'd be walking around a casino, you know, my dad or grandfather, they'd pick up a chair, turn it <laughs> upside down, and they go, hey, hey, boys, you know, look, that's our name under the, that seat there. Gather um, round, boys. It sounds yeah, like the Griswold. So my friends give me a fair bit of shit for it because, like, we'll be, you know, travelling through Europe, meant to be backpacking as, like, 19, 20-year-olds and yeah. meeting girls and, you know, having beers and stuff and... I'd just be spotting all this furniture and, you know, like we'd go into a store, my friends would buy clothes and I'd go spot that one chair in the corner and be like, that's cool. <laughs> that's a classic. Yeah. Uh, furniture geek. Yeah, that's it. Proud wow. furniture geek. Proud furniture geek. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that whole um, heading overseas, spotting an idea, bringing it back to Australia, it's not the first time it's been mentioned on this show. I had... Um, at least one guest, David, well, Jeff Harris, Flight Centre, um, David Milne, Noodle Box. David, I remember, saw these just these things called a noodle box um, as he was coming back home from a backpacking holiday. He saw them at um, Singapore Hawkers Markets. And he goes, we've got to eat out of it. And he'd seen them on Seinfeld. And he's, we've got to bring them back. Okay. You know, it, um, it, what's that whole overseas thing? Do you, uh, is Australia... Um, often behind and we have to head overseas to find the good stuff? I think when you're overseas, you just get, you know, different inspiration and you'll see things that in Australia, you've seen the same thing done the same way every day and then you go overseas and new experiences and you're like, well, yeah, that's really interesting and, you know, it's not really been done in Australia and, you know, you could bring that idea with your own twist to it back here. So Mm -hmm. I just think it's the benefits generally of, you know, open your horizons and getting out there and meeting new people and, you know, having new experiences. And that's where all these good ideas come. I, I think you're right. It's not. It's probably not about Australia being behind. It's about wherever you are in the world running a business, um, actually stopping and getting out of your comfort zone, getting out of your geographical area, getting out of what you nor- where you normally are into a new space. And you probably do see things that you wouldn't normally see. Yeah, that's it. I'm sure, you know, many entrepreneurs come to Australia and go back to their home country and, I don't know, maybe set up like a, a boomerang business or, you know, something pretty Aussie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe fly, fly, fly swatters, you know, or that a, fly buzzer. A boomerang business. I wonder what the return policy would be on that. Yeah, four returns. <laughs> boom, boom. Uh, now, Dean, interesting, my, my next question might answer itself because I kind of... um. Didn't realise 60 years in the furniture business, um, all of a sudden, young Dean now goes off and says, I'm going to start selling online. Uh, My last guest was the owner of health.com.au, and he's a completely uh, online business, and he did have a lot of naysayers. What are you doing going into a crowded marketplace and selling completely online? It'll never work, and it's working. Did did you have any any resistance within the family, or was it like, yeah, no, that's an obvious next progression? Yeah, so back in 2006, nobody was selling furniture purely online. There were some stores that maybe had a showroom and a website on the side. But So at the time, it was a crazy idea. And, you know, a lot of our friends and family were saying it's never going to work. You know, people want to touch and feel a chair and sit on it and, you know, see how it feels. And But, yeah, like uh, my business partner and I knew that, um, you know, online was the future. And funnily enough, actually... I got a little bit of resistance from immediate family, but then my grandfather, who was in his 80s at the time, 
he's like, Dean, I can see, you know, this is definitely like the future. I don't really wow. understand online, but you know, like he started, he was having computer lessons twice a week to oh, try to understand mate, it. Beautiful. So yeah, they got full support from the family, even though people thought we're a little bit crazy. Your grandfather, the computer lessons, trying to understand it just because it was something to do, or he actually, at, at the age of 80, wanted to explore this new thing called the internet because it might be good for business? Yeah, a little bit of both. You know, I think, um, you know, entrepreneurs always want to learn and improve no matter at what age. So my grandfather had seen that, you know, all his grandkids are on the internet all the time and we started selling furniture on the internet and so he was just, yeah, interested and he's probably the only, you know, 80-year-old that I ever saw having a computer lesson and he's probably more switched on in the computer than my parents were. Fantastic. Yeah, well, we're going to talk online marketing uh, further down this interview and, and we can talk about who's online because I think that myth of it's just for the young people is clearly well and truly busted. But I'd love to know, get a profile of who's buying. But before we do, uh, let's just talk. So Milan Direct launched eight years ago, uh, pretty you know, new selling furniture, 100% online, no retail outlet, quite an interesting concept. Um, at what point, Dean, did you think, huh, this is getting big. This is going to work. Was it early or did it take years? Um, so it was always like it started off as a hobby and like a passion of mine. So we never actually set out to create, you know, Australia's number one online furniture retailer. That was never really a goal. It was more about, I love this furniture. Um, I want to bring it to the public because at the time there was a massive gap price-wise. Like the chairs we were selling were, you know, three to four times the price. So for us, it was just, you know, a pretty cool experience to, to test out the model and without any big investments. So like, let's bring in, we started off with a 20-foot container, which is the smallest size you can get. And then that container sold out pretty quick. So then the next order, we doubled and we got a 40-foot container. That sold out pretty quick. So we doubled that and we, you know, got four containers, eight containers. And then it basically just evolved organically from there. And then, you know, after a year or two, I'm like, okay, well, I can probably keep doing this now and don't have to worry about you know immediate job security because it seems to be working and um but you know at the time i was living at home in my you know parents house and there's not that much risk when you're i was 23 when we started milan direct and we just went out with like you know this is a passion of ours we love it let's just give it a crack and um yeah we were lucky enough to have organic growth and never had to borrow a dollar to get the business up and running so there wasn't, doesn't sound like there was a point in those past eight years where you've gone, ooh, it's getting a bit wobbly here, may not work. Never may not work. Like the truth is about business is that we have hardcore challenges every single day. And Like what? You, like what? Uh, so on almost day one, like our first container that arrived, I had flown over to China, I'd spent weeks and weeks with our factories teaching them everything I know about making furniture and I taught them how to improve the quality of, of the chairs that we were making and I spent you know, all that focus on the quality of the chair because I wanted our customers to have the best quality chair and then flew back to Australia, we'd pre-sold 90% of that container and we had customers literally lining up at our warehouse door and Ruslan and I at the time, my partner, we decided to save our money and we'd unload that first container ourselves because we thought, you know, <laughs> we don't want to like increase our costs and yeah, give yeah. 300 bucks to yeah. a warehouse to do it. So, well, that was our first mistake because it took us like a day and a half to unload a container when if you pay a warehouse who specializes in that, they'll get a forklift in unloaded within, you know, 30 minutes. Yeah. So that was the first mistake. We unloaded that container and we found out that, I, you know, I assume that if they make a great quality product, our factory partners, they would put all the products in good uh, quality packaging. So, you know, I was like really annoyed. Uh, yeah, I yeah. take out all, all the chairs and all the chairs came in a bag. So we're selling individual chairs to individual customers and our factory had packed these great quality chairs on top of each other um, without any packaging. And I get on the phone to the factory, I'm like, how am I meant to send the product out to the customer? And basically, you know, Chinese manufacturing is all about starting and finishing a job and they're used to the retail model where people would drive into like a store at chatty and pick up the product and take it home and packaging is not important so yeah 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 
that, that's yeah, such it's so interesting. Like being aware of there's such a big lesson there. I remember reading an interview somewhere along the line with Sir Jonathan Ives from Apple, who you know you'd think, well, he'd just be responsible for making the iPod look good and work well, and you know just the product design and look and feel and functionality, but. He spends a lot of time getting the packaging right. And, you know, I'm sure you'd be uh, in tune with this. But, you know, when you do get an Apple product, the, the, the unboxing is, is quite an exciting moment. Yes, an experience. An, an experience. Fantastic imagine, yeah. And for us, the experience is to ensure the product gets to the customer in perfect condition. And Australia is a really big country, so you need, like, bulletproof packaging. So from that day, we had to tell all our customers, like, look, we're really sorry. Can you please come back tomorrow morning? We'll have your product for you then. There's been a bit of a delay. And then we had to scramble overnight to find all the right size boxes, you know, in Melbourne and repackage everything ourselves and we got it to the customer the next morning. Um, from that point on, we've learned a lesson, you know, never assume anything in business and triple check like every single detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I, you know, again, uh, sorry for all the Apple references, but, you know, Jobs was just like... Uh anal about every single detail which i find amazing but i also completely understand because like for you milan direct is your is your is your dream your passion it's your idea and to to make sure that it is delivered on brand every step of the way i mean it's it's critical it's like that for any business owner isn't it yeah 100 percent. and you know you take pride in you know the product and service you're delivering and if you know, I know if I was a customer, what I'd expect, I'd want the best quality product, I'd want the best customer service. And if we fail to deliver that at any point, I get really frustrated and quickly look to, to fix issues like that to make sure that, you know, we're always providing the, that, the service that I'd want to receive as a customer to our, you know, Melandra customer base. It's specific to furniture, Dean, I, um, I've had the experience, and I'd be interested to know how you would can control this, because it almost seems out of your control. But... We had some furniture delivered once. Uh, I wasn't home. Uh, My wife was. She took delivery of it. Um, The the removal or the removalists, the delivery guys came in. Uh, It was couches and beds, right? We were moving Mm -hmm. to a new house and uh, we'd had a great experience buying these couches and beds. We got them delivered. The two guys who delivered it uh, were unsavory characters to say the least and my wife actually rang me and said i don't feel actually that safe can you come home and while they're while they're setting it up uh they were rough their customer service you know they were delivery guys you know Mm. but that absolutely reflected from our point of view back on the people we bought that stuff off how do you control that it's probably the biggest challenge we have in business today because you're right from the customer's point of view Our warehouse is, you know, even though it's a third party, that's Milan Direct. The freight company, even though it's a third party, that's Milan Direct. The whole way through. So, um, but, you know, in Australia, it's especially challenging because it's such a big country and we don't have the best freight, you know, providers in this country because compared to Milan Direct, we operate in the UK and in the UK you have DHL and UPS and all the big global companies. They're not coming to Australia who, you know, they do a fantastic job in the UK, like, They'll deliver our product anywhere in the UK within one day. You know, it also helps that the UK is much smaller. Mm. You know, more people in a smaller area. But there are all these, you know, big and great freight companies that are coming to Australia to, you know, give the investment here because it's not worth it for the 20, you know, 2 million people in such a big country. It's not worth the investment for them. As a result, you know, we're left with like, yeah, it's, it's just challenging. We've, yeah. We believe we've partnered with the, the best freight providers, but... There definitely could be better options out there. There's just not at this stage. So yeah. it's I reckon that, a... that'll change. I mean, online getting massive. Um, you know, there is going to. I wouldn't be surprised if there was just like a dedicated business that started up that would just completely focused on the online re- on delivering for the online retailer and understanding their unique set of problems. Yeah, well, actually, Australia Post is one company doing it really well. Um, they've started to realise in the last few years that online is the future, especially for parcel and package delivery and we use Australia Post whenever we can but they've got size restrictions so yeah. anything for us from homewares up to an office chair we'll send with them and they do get the product to our customer in record time with great customer service and you know friendly delivery people. Um, yep. The only issue is you know they can't take our big outdoor you know wicker sets and um, larger products but we keep telling Aussie Post we're in there all the time like guys you're doing it great. You know, we'll give you all our business if you just allow for any size box. So hopefully, you know, Australia Post see the benefits there and 
expand into all sizes. Yeah, because, absolutely. Yeah, they're a good one. Dean, I want to uh, move on. And by the way, listeners, I'm talking to Dean Ramler, who is co-founder of Milan Direct, uh, one of the biggest online furniture retailers going around. And I want to talk about selling online and how you go about marketing Milan Direct, Dean. But just to stack some numbers around where you've got to in the last eight years, I know you're a private company and and reluctant to reveal too much. But from what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the industry in which you operate in Australia, $300 million industry? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and you, Milan Director, are experiencing 100% growth year on year, which is, you know, that is tremendous. Can you wrap some numbers around website traffic, average sale price, number of employees, um, countries that you operate in? Just give us a, a, a sense of size. So Milan Direct, um, Ibisworld came out with a report last year, which, you know, it's an independent research company. And Ibis World ranked Milan Direct as the number one online furniture retailer, showing that we're selling more furniture online than IKEA, Harvey Norman, and Freedom Furniture. So all the you know the big players in the industry in, in Australia, in Australia yeah. online, um, and so we're looking to you know continue to maintain our number one position, and we're always expanding. We've gone from having a couple of years ago maybe a hundred products in the range. Today we've got three to four thousand on the Australian website alone. Um, and we're aiming to have over 10,000 products by June and 20,000 by the end of the year. So we're really scaling up now. And um, globally, we've sold furniture to over 40 countries. Uh, we have a warehouse in the UK. We've had warehouses in New Zealand before. And we sell right throughout Europe. And, you know, we've sold to, to Gibraltar, Spain, Greece, Israel. Actually, the orders to Greece never made it there, but we still sold it there. <laughs> so they got lost in transit, so we don't ship there anymore. Right. Um, so yeah, shipping you know, all around the world. And the beauty about online is that we're doing all of this out of our little office in Albert Park in Melbourne. Yeah. So all our UK operations and customer service, the call centers run out of here. Um, and with online, you know, people don't know where in the world you're applying from. Like the people in Australia don't know that exactly where we are as long as you're providing fantastic customer service mm. you can run an online business from anywhere so okay well let's let's talk about that because um one of the things that i think any business owner bricks and mortar online offline can learn from uh in terms of you online retailers is how to remove fear from the purchase decision right uh fear offline can be done because you can go into a shop or you can meet with someone and you can eyeball them and you can touch and feel and talk right how do you uh maybe is there a top three things that you do on your website to remove any fear that people have yeah definitely an important part of online um we call those you know having like certain trust elements and factors built into the website to make people feel comfortable um Few ways we do that. Actually, one really new and exciting way, which only started two months ago, was Google rolled out a program called Google Trust Stores for this exact reason. They want customers to feel safe. And Milan Director was selected as one of four um, companies in Australia to to test and you know pilot the program. And um, basically, there's a little badge on the homepage of the Milan Direct website which says, you know, we have over ninety percent. Um, on-time fast deliveries. So, you know, our average delivery time is between one to two days. Mm-hmm. It's pretty good. And our customer service rating is over, I believe, around 97%. If those ratings drop to under 90%, Google is going to remove that from your website because they only want, you know, the absolute best online retailers to have that badge so customers can be reassured. So, What was, that, one- what was that Google um, a piece of software called? Yeah, it's called Google Trusted Stores. Google and Trusted Stores. It was it still in beta? Launch. Yeah, it's still in beta. And Milan Direct, yeah, it's just one of four companies that has it on their website. Right. If you have a look, it'll be in the bottom right-hand corner of our homepage or any page on our site. Yeah, right, okay. Um, so, yeah, Google understands important and trust. And other ways we do that is um, we would have, you know, we take really, we spend a lot of money and time taking really fantastic photos of our products. So we want to take any guesswork away from the customer and show this is exactly the product that you'll be receiving. Yep. And we'll take, you know, up to eight photos of each product and every different angle. We've started taking product videos of, you know, all our new and latest products. And that basically takes the showroom into the customer's home. And, you know, it eliminates any any perceived risk because the customer, you know, they see exactly what they're getting. We also, it's important for trust to 
we back all our products with um, a 14-day money-back guarantee, which says to the customer, take it home, and if for any reason you're not happy with it, you can send it back for a full refund. How do they and, send it back? Uh, we'll pick it up. They contact us. We'll send them a label. They'll put it on the box, and then we'll send our freight companies and pick it up. But completely free of charge. Less the delivery fee. But yes. many, of our, many, many of our products run free shipping, so they're right. all free of charge for sure. Right. Um, but, yeah, as a result, you know, nobody ever takes it up because we often, you know, get calls when they receive the product or emails. And they're like, guys, thank you so much. You've exceeded my expectations. Like, you know, it's much better than I was picturing from an online retailer. I'm like, hang on a minute. You know, we're still a furniture retailer here. <laughs> yeah, 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 the trial. You know, like, we think we've got great quality product and, you know, that's proven in the fact that 30 to 40% of our customers are repeat customers. So we find that often uh, a customer will make a small purchase of, say, one office chair, and then they'll come back and buy 39 extra office chairs for the, the whole office fit out once they've seen the quality of that first one. Right. right. One, one thing I notice you do, and I, I, I don't mind them, these light boxes, I call them, or these pop-ups, which um, as soon as you go onto the Milan Direct site, I've just gone onto it, I've refreshed twice. I've had a Facebook pop-up saying, like us on Facebook, and I've had another one say, join your email list for, uh, to be first to hear about new deals. Um, uh, what, what, what percentage increase do you see of um, take-up uh, or grabbing someone's email address when you put that light box up? It definitely adds significantly and because, you know, people, they do want to stay in touch and see what our... At Lund Direct, we do super aggressive discounted deals via our newsletters. And, right. Um, you know, and that's the thing. It's one thing taking a person's email address, but then if you send them a, a, a newsletter with a boring deal or a deal that's like $10 oh, yeah. off, yeah. they're going to unsubscribe. So we make sure to never disrespect our customers and only send them emails with, like, fantastic discounts. So... We're offering, uh, we're often doing products at under cost price just to wow the customers and, you know, be like, wow, how do, you know, how do you sell a chair for that price? Mm. And, and that's how you get repeat business and get to number one, I guess. Let's talk discounting because, um, you know, it can end in tears. Uh, you can only be so cheap before you can't, it's not worth selling anymore. Uh, is discounting something that you use strategically as what we'd call like a loss leader? Wow, that chair's cheap. I might go and see what else they've got. And then once they're in their store, they're buying product at decent margin? Yeah, it's pretty much a general rule of retail. And at the end of the day, the, the customer benefits out of that. We've done many products at well below cost. Like the other day, we did a kitchen utensil set at $4. The product cost to us would have been closer to $20. And for us to deliver that product, cost at least $10. And so we're doing why'd it. you do that? Well, one, we've got thousands of them. So, you know, like instead of having thousands of products sit in your warehouse getting dust, we'd rather our customers enjoy that, even though it's costing us around $15 to give that to the customer. And the idea is to bring in, to get people talking about you. And people then posted this deal on, you know, forums online saying, check this crazy deal out. Yeah. As a result, we get thousands of people coming to our store to see our whole offering. And we find that's a good way to, you know, win new customers, I guess. So it all become all of a sudden becomes like an advertising expense, you know? Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, yeah, know, instead okay. of running, spending five grand for a, a newspaper advertisement, we'll spend five grand to give product away. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the customers benefit most out of that more than a, an ad in the paper. Yeah, gotcha. What do you think, Dean, about this trend? And there is does seem to be a trend of online retailers um, taking an offline presence, a high street presence, but opening up stores where you can't buy, you can only go and view? Yeah, I find that pretty silly and frustrating, I guess. It's something I'd never do at Milan Direct because, one, it would be completely against our business model of being a pure play online retailer. And the whole reason we do that is not because we don't want to talk to customers face-to-face or show our product. We back all our products. We back our customer service. We do that to ensure we can offer the absolute rock bottom price to our customers. If we open up a pop up store or a physical store on, you know, on a high street, our costs are going to increase, mm. and then uh, you have to raise your prices. And what we find is that customers today, especially with the internet, especially with shopping comparison uh, websites, people want the best deal. So we would never risk not having the best deal in Australia by opening a store, especially when then you can't purchase. It's kind of like What's the point? You know, if you're going to open a store, have a cash register there and make a transaction. 
What do you see then as the next development, next big development? Because I imagine you'd kind of want to be on the leading edge of, of online retail. I think it might actually move back a bit to what retail would have been like um, 10, 20 years ago and things are going to start becoming more customizable again and more personable. So you see a lot of like, you know, the good uh, clothing companies like Nike or Adidas doing it where you can go into the store, jump on their computer or do this online and make your own like shoe, for example. I did this at Chadston a couple of years ago. I designed my own shoe. I wrote, you know, like my name on it. I picked all these random like colors that you'd never see on a normal shoe. Yeah. And I did that and I was happy to pay double the price because that shoe was tailored to my taste. So I think that's the future for, for online retail and all retail, giving customers back the power to, you know, have choose exactly what they want instead of what you find today is mainly just mass offerings of yeah. similar product, you know. Cookie cutter kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. interesting. And, and I imagine too, um, well, I, in fact, I, only this morning uh, I read where we are, we are now at the tipping point where uh, more online purchases are done through uh, mobile devices, uh, tablets and smartphones versus laptops and desktops. Are you seeing that? Yeah, definitely. We see majority of our traffic is through mobile. Um, the issue is for a furniture retailer is not many people still are going to buy furniture off a mobile because it's generally a higher ticket yep. value item and, you know, you'd probably want to open up on a PC and see the big images of a big chair. Yep. Um, but what we find is even, you know, at Milan Direct, people are still searching off their mobile. So um, you really have to have a good mobile site, a good mobile offering. Everything we do from a marketing point of view, we test on the mobile. So if we send a newsletter draft you know, amongst the team, we're all checking it on our mobile phones to see how it looks because the formatting is going to be a little bit different. Yeah, mate, how many people don't do that? I've been guilty yeah. of that too. I mean, uh, you, you just don't realise just how different things can look on the mobile. It, 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 illegible to the point of yeah, illegible. Yeah, and even, even subject lines on a mobile, you're only going to see half a subject line, which means don't crap on a subject line. Get your key message right up the yeah. front or... People not going to read it. Yeah, well, I even find that with um, with uh, podcasts on iTunes, where most people find them, that subject line, and and they're listening to them on their on their iPads or iPods uh, or iPhones. That that subject line, you got literally like three or four words. So if you start with today's guest is. You know, yeah. it's like big deal. You just you got to cut to the chase. So uh, that's interesting. What? How far? Let's see. If, how far can you go of dispel, dispelling the myth, Dean, that um, it's just young people buying online? Oh yeah, it's definitely not just young people buying online. Um, we, I'm in Google Analytics. My team's in Google Analytics all day, every day, and it's a great dashboard that Google provides and you can actually, there's a new feature in analytics now called demographics and you can enable demographics um, for anyone who visits your site and that shows you exactly how old people are, whether they're male or female, what their interests are and what we're finding as an online furniture retailer is um, our target market, you know, is getting a little bit older and older as, um, you know, I guess people like my parents' age come in online and, you know, learn to shop and browse. And so, yeah, there's like, there's really no, no age restriction. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas a few years ago, maybe it was only, you know, people in their twenties that were shopping online. Yeah, right. Okay. So well and truly um, myth busted right there. You, you're a big, big fan of Google tools, Dean. I know you've, you've mentioned so far uh, Google Analytics and Google, what was that other one called? Uh, uh, trusted Google, Stores. Trusted Stores. Yeah. Uh, previously, we had a chat. You talked about Google Trends, not something I use a lot. How do you use Google Trends? Yeah, so Google Trends is probably the best free tool available on the internet uh, wow. for, an online, for an online retailer. So 100% free. If you just go to Google and search Google Trends, you'll see it pop up. And it's basically a tool which shows you... Um, what people are searching for. So it allows you to, it takes a guesswork out of business, you know. So instead of thinking like, oh, I kind of feel like this product may work, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. It'll show you, well, are people searching for that, you know, product range. So, and you can break it down by by country, by year. You can look over the last five years or the last, you know, 60 days or 120 days. Uh, we can look at, I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, when Milan Direct decided to launch in the UK back in 2009, we used Google Trends, it was called Google Insights at the time, and we punched in 
our top five product categories into uh, into Google Trends, and it showed that what people search for in Australia is very different to the UK. Um, you know, for many different reasons. So outdoor furniture, which is really popular for us here, we didn't really launch with that full range in the UK because people are not searching for it. Um, and it broke it down on every different category level like that. And as a result, when we launched in the UK, you know, we've been like a success from day one because um, using this tool took out a lot of that guesswork and we could see, you know, will the products work? Obviously, you can't just use that tool alone. You have to back it with your own internal knowledge and systems, mm -hmm. but it's definitely, you know, it should be the number one starting point for any product decision. That's tremendous. So is it literally, uh, I imagine you could drill down, but you can literally go in there, see in your category, your industry, a product type, and Google is going to say, well, uh, you've just keyed in couches. Here's, here's specific search terms that people are keying in when they're looking for couches. Yeah, and it'll show you which which are like the rising terms in popularity. Um, so volumes uh, relative to other keywords. Yeah, correct? right. Yeah, and so you know, a few years ago in Australia, we knew that outdoor furniture was popular, and we started having a look at which outdoor furniture was popular, and we said there was a growing trend for timber outdoor furniture, and we saw this growing trend on the chart, and we're like, it's, you know, come out of nowhere a bit. More and more Australians are searching for outdoor timber furniture online. Based on that, we launched a range of outdoor timber furniture, which has been a huge hit from um, from day one. So definitely a good starting point. Can I give you a business idea, Dean? Yeah. We just moved into a new house. We've got a pool, and uh, I have been trying to find good quality, good-looking pool furniture, and I'm really struggling. I, I can only find those lilos that you and I would have grown up with, you know, down the beach that you're... I found the, the odd, the odd good-looking beanbag type thing, but it fills up with water. I bought a couple of those. I, I think there's an opportunity for Milan Direct to go into pool furniture. Ah, oh, to use to use in, in the, the pool. pool in the pool. Oh, cool! I was going to say to use next to the pool. We've got a great range you can check out. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But yeah, no, that's a good idea actually. For Thank the, you. In, in the water. Yeah. Thank you. Twenty percent. Yeah, okay, now, Dean, before we wrap up, mate, I just want to talk uh, specifically a marketing of, of Milan Direct uh, in terms of what else you do. Um, your view on tradi traditional advertising, TV, radio, outdoor. Yeah, look, we've done a lot of traditional advertising over the years, including, you know, we've spent, you know, a lot of money on billboards, outdoor billboards and magazine advertising. Uh, never tried TV and probably never would. And... We're pretty much cutting most of that back now and keeping 95% of our ad spend online. And the reason we're doing that is because online is measurable. We can see what every single dollar, whether that uh, for a keyword, whether it's leading to a sale or if it's causing a customer to exit from our site. So being 100% measurable, we can constantly optimize and improve our online advertising on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. So we've got you know a big in-house marketing team who are constantly analysing over 100,000 plus keywords on a given day and making constant you know, improvements to these. And as a result, we know our online advertising is at least break it even, if not being profitable. And again, you know, use the, we're using Google AdWords and we're monitoring all that through Google Analytics. And because it's measurable and we've got control over it, we're happy to, our budget's unlimited, basically. When Google comes to us and they're like, you know, well, on direct, how much are you going to spend this month? And we're like, Google, it's unlimited. As long as we're breaking even and, you know, we don't need you to tell us if we're doing well or not, we can track that through the tools you provide. Um, so we're in complete control, whereas magazines, billboards, you know, it may be working. And yeah. I, li I like seeing my name up on a billboard. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. And taking a few photos standing next to a billboard. But who knows if it works or not? You know, like there's a... There's a famous marketing quote like from years back, I know 50% of my marketing spend is working, I just don't know which 50%. And so as a result, online you don't have that problem, you know 100% of your marketing spend is working. So when, you talk online, when you talk online advertising, Dean, there's obviously there's AdWords, there's Facebook ads, there's banner ads, there's SEO, where's the kind of majority of that money being spent? Is it on Google AdWords or is it, is it across the board? It's mainly on Google AdWords, um, and, and then you know we do a bit on other other platforms and some content banners and um, for online business shopping comparison sites are um, important. 
Um, actually, an interesting one for your, your listeners, which not many people would ever be aware about, but there's something to be careful with with online advertising. I've never had this problem on Google, so I'll just say that it was on other providers that are not Google but are competitors with Google in that we've set up online advertising accounts with them and we've spotted through Google Analytics that 80% of the clicks of our spend was being done by basically a bot overseas and wow. not by an actual human. So, um, you know, because, and we found this because on Google Analytics, you see that 80% of your traffic is coming from, it was like Kentucky in America. Now, how many people in Kentucky are going to shop on an Australian online retail store? <laughs> and then you can track through analytics that the time on site was zero seconds. Oh, you know, like, wow. how do you spend no time on the site? And out of all that, you didn't have one sale. So obviously, a bot can't make a purchase. Dude, and, that's, yeah. that's, uh, yeah, that's scary. Uh, and I, may, I imagine that wouldn't be Google. That would be one of the smaller players. Well, they're still, I think they're big players. Yeah, so. right. Okay. Hey, yeah, um, yeah, one, so. one, one of the things, talking SEO, um, one of the things, I mean, Google have made massive changes. Now, I, I imagine SEO for Milan Direct in the early days was a gold mine because you would just be keyword stacking. You'd have all your metadata sorted out. You know, it'd be very, very controllable. But up, you know, the most recent update, which is the Hummingbird update to the oh. algorithm, demands now that really metadata ain't as important as just creating amazing content. Google wants you, the website owner, the, the retailer, the online retailer, to solve problems, to make the, the website, to make the internet more interesting. Um, have you had to very, uh, have you had to make a big change to your SEO, your search engine optimization strategy? No, we've never, we've always had the exact same strategy from day one and we've never had to change it and we've, we're always ranking at the very top of Google, doesn't matter what the changes are because the whole idea of SEO is to not try to fool Google. If you're a good company with a good product range, and a well set up website with you know good categories, um, you will rank well. So, for example, um, office chairs on our office share page, we have eighty odd office chairs. As a result, when Google you know crawls your website, they go, okay, office chairs. The meta title says it's office chairs. Oh, look, there's eighty office chairs. Bam, number one on Google. Mm -hmm. So we've never tried to trick Google because you don't have to. The companies that are trying to, you know, keyword spamming and all these SEO tricks, that's because they're a company that doesn't actually have a good range, they don't have a good offering. So if you have to, you know, try to like trick Google, then you're doomed to fail no matter what anyway. So Yeah, I like that. Um, I like, I yeah. like that uh, reverse approach. You know, just don't try and trick Google. Just you know, write for the human. Create content for the human. Yeah, we can't, you can't outsmart Google anyway. And so just focus on running a good business and the rest will take care of itself. You, 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 um, you're active in social media. Uh, Facebook, I'm guessing, would be your, if you, you know, had to use one channel, one social channel, would Facebook be it? Yeah, Facebook for us is our preferred channel because, you know, Milan Direct, our products are very visual. They're great looking furniture pieces. And Facebook is a visual medium. You know, you can post really big and nice photos on there and, then people can engage and discuss on different design topics. So we find that, you know, a better platform for our business compared to like Twitter, which, you know, just, you know, short text posts, whatever it is. Um, you know, so yeah, we invest a lot of time in our Facebook community and we enjoy, Facebook is great to engage with your customer and fan base and get direct feedback. And, you know, we're always asking our customers, would they like us to add this product in this color? And, what are their thoughts on, you know, this range compared to that range? And um, it's really great market research. And we, you know, take all that feedback on board and, you know, base a lot of our product decision making on what our customers are wanting. Because if you really listen to what your customers want, um, you know, making profits the easy part. All you have to do is, you know, then we know how to source the furniture, how to manufacture the furniture. We know how to deliver it. And by using, I guess, the free tools on Google plus listening to your customers, um, you can really, you know, deliver uh, products that people are wanting and searching for. Oh, I love your use of Facebook in um, helping, the, giving the tribe, as I would call them, the opportunity to contribute to the growth of Milan Direct. You know, what do you think of these colours, this shape, this design? You know, should we go into pool furniture maybe? The next question you ask them, getting that, it gives them a sense as if they're contributing to the brand. Yeah, 100%. Mm. You know, it's a bit of like, brand ownership and then they feel like, you know, some 
maybe a small part of loyalty to the brand. Next time they're looking to buy some furniture, hopefully they choose us over another company. Um, we do some fun things on Facebook. Like we even we ran a competition. It was like two years ago now, where we had a new range of office chairs coming out, and we posted the photo on Facebook, and we said, "All right, here's a competition. We want our customers to name this new range of chairs." And whoever comes up with the best name and winning name, one, we'll use that name, which we have, and two, we'll send you a free chair. So we got like, you know, over 100 or 200 really smart and clever, you know, entries for that chair. And to this day, that's now the name of that Rover office chair series Love that it. we have. Yeah. Crowdsourcing right there. Do, do, you have a, um, do you have a small group of raving fans, Milan Direct? You, you tend to find there's yeah, it's definitely a small percentage that keep on posting and engaging. And, and what we find is great because they're, they're design lovers. They're passionate about great design. And, um, you know, so we're always posting design topics. And, yeah, there's a handful of people that contribute the most. And um, you know, when we run competitions, a lot of those people are winning competitions. And um, this is great to have people that are passionate, you know, share the same passion that we do for furniture and and great design and, um, you know, it makes, mm. that's probably the most enjoyable part of business to be able to share that. Is, is, there any, is there any way you nurture that small group of raving fans? Yeah, I guess you nurture them by, one, providing great and free content on social media. So, you know, obviously you don't charge people to read the blogs that we spend a lot of time and effort writing, which we post for our fans. And, mm-hmm. um, and then really to, to not waste their time by providing, when we post a deal on Facebook, it's going to be a great deal. You know, it's going to be like, under cost price or fifty percent off or some really huge savings that they could never find in a brick and mortar store or or most likely at any other online retailer. Mm-hmm. So basically just to respect people's time and then you know they'll maintain their engagement with you. Love it, Dean. Mate, I really appreciate you sharing some some insights from what is uh, a categorically confirmed Australia's largest most successful online furniture retailer. It's invaluable. Uh, Thanks so much for coming on the Small Business Big Marketing Show, Dean. No problem. Thanks for your time, Tim. It's good to chat. Empty chairs at empty tables where my friends will meet no more. Wowie, wowie, wee. How much marketing gold was driven from that little fireside chat with Dean? Now, before I get stuck into my top four learnings, Let me quickly tell you about Swiftly.com. And I say quickly because that is exactly what Swiftly is all about. Small design fixes fast, real fast, actually. Uh, I've had a couple of listeners already uh, surprised at just how quickly they had some design tweaks made to some of their marketing collateral this week. Swiftly is ideal for altering your business card details, your logo alterations, banner ad updates, even photo touch-ups. And who couldn't do with a little photo touch-up love? You simply upload the artwork that needs fixing, tell them what needs doing, and boom, within one hour, that puppy is done. All for just 15 bucks. Check them out, swiftly.com. That's S-W-I-F-T-L-Y.com. You are going to love them. Now, I've got to say, there were quite a few learnings. So getting it down to my top four from my fireside chat with Dean is no mean feat. However, here's what I reckon. Number one, get out of your comfort zone. We've all got to do it. Get out and look for new ideas in places that we just wouldn't normally go to. And, you know, go to a course you wouldn't normally go to. Buy a magazine you wouldn't normally read. Ring someone you wouldn't normally ask a question of. But get out of your comfort zone and experience new things. It changes something in our brain. I don't know how it works. I was saying to my son the other night, he's, he, he's not a big fan of maths, and, but he's loving his art. So I said, mate, you know, break your maths up by going and doing some drawing. Now, that's not getting out of your comfort zone. It's kind of leaving, it's leaving a discomfort zone and going to a comfort zone in drawing. But, you know, it just breaks it up. It gets us thinking differently. Number two, learning from my chat with Dean Get those trust elements built into your website. Figure out where the fear points are with your buyers when they come to your website and have insert some trust elements. Have a look at milandirect.com and see the trust elements that are scattered throughout that website. And it just, it makes you feel at ease. You know, it makes you feel like, yeah, I can give these people my money. I trust them. Trust, big word in marketing. Number three, Google Trends. Whoa. No, none of us are using that enough, I'm guessing. 
seeing what people are searching for online real time right now and then breaking it down into all the various different categories and brands and different areas of your business. Go and check out Google Trends. I'd bookmark. I have bookmarked Google Trends since that chat with Dean. Number four, the whole idea of SEO, search engine optimization, is not to fool Google. It's a big concept to get your head around, but you know, I think many for many years, uh, people have been trying to fool, fool Google, whether it be through keyword stacking or writing unnatural copy for the search engines and not for the human. That time has changed. Create great content. Put good stuff on your website. Google will pick it up if it's well marked, well labeled, well described, and you are home and hosed from a search engine optimization point of view. And, and Dean focuses on that as opposed to any other aspect of search engine optimization. Not to say there isn't other aspects, but they're the ones that Dean focuses on. So team, I hope you loved that fireside chat with Dean. There are so many more fireside chats coming up. Uh, If you did like that chat, if you didn't like that chat, head over to the show notes for episode 175 of the Small Business Big Marketing Show and tell me what you thought. Okay, time for a listener question. This one is from Simone Dakuna or Dakuna. Uh, her she's from New Zealand. Her business is mum to the core.co.nz. She says, Hey Tim, one of my roles is within IT in Marcoms. That would be marketing communications. All well and good. When it comes to marketing my own business, however, I promote well using the conventional methods and have and have done Facebook push promos via large online databases of mums here in New Zealand. However, the mind boggles as to what first when it comes to driving my online marketing campaign. Should I do content, blogging, Google AdWords, etc., etc.? What do you suggest I do first? Thanks, Simone, with a big smile. Simone, I am going to take a step back. I'm not necessarily going to give you the answer you are looking for because your first step is to get your website sorted out. That's what Net Registry do, but I'm not going to hear I'm not here to promote Net Registry right this moment, but I do need you to get your website sorted because it's a little bit all over the place. So, here's some tips. Number 1, you have got a massive amount of online real estate dedicated to an image that's kind of cut off, but it's a mum holding a baby. Your logo's massive, it says mum to the core. I think you need to allocate some of that space that you're currently using to telling us what this website, what this business is all about. Give me a line that just describes what Mum to the Core is all about. I I honestly don't know what it is looking at at the site right now. So that would be number one. You've got a blank field with a go button there. Don't know what that's for. It's again, it's top right hand corner, prime real estate. Lose it. Like if if it's not if it's not serving serving a role, lose it on your homepage. Uh, I'd love to see an introductory video of you. I'm guessing this is some kind of service that you offer offer mums. I'd love to see you introduce yourself maybe and tell people what they can expect in this site. Alternatively, a nice little explainer video if the mum to the core offer is a bit complicated, then a nice little 30 to 60 second explainer video, an animated video could be could do the trick. Um, so I'd love to see that. You know, if I scroll down, you've got book, welcome, and about us, but still you're not really telling me what the business is all about. So I think one of the things many of us do, we we kind of forget to look at our businesses with the customer hat on, and we look at it with our hat on. Look at this website, Simone, with customer's hat on, and have have a look to see what you see through those lenses. The about us page is again, you know, like I want to, it's not a picture of you. There's not a picture of your team. There's lots of copy, but again, lots of space dedicated that, to that image and no introduction of the team. I'd love to see uh, the people buy, people behind the business. People buy from people. You've got a testimonials button on the nav bar. I don't know. Nah, lose it, lose it. Scatter the testimonials throughout the website would be my my view. Great to see you've got some FAQs. You could probably create little blog posts out of them. Under the resources page, you've got blog and press. Oh, I don't know, lose press. It's not you haven't got enough press to really kind of make that um, a, a valid section of your website. And your blog um, is not that up to date. So if you're going to blog, 
Here's the thing. Get clear on your editorial mission, and you would have heard me talk about that many times before. Go back to past episodes if you want to kind of dig deep on that. And then you've got your Contact Us page, which is kind of there. Yeah, but like, what about a street address? What about a phone number? What about a photo, you know? Make it easy for people to contact you, as I said at the start of this show in my little editorial rant. So, Simone, before you worry about all that other online marketing stuff, I think it's time to get your website sorted. And uh, I hope that helps. Thanks so much for your question, Simone. And uh, anyone else, feel free to send me a question. Questions at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. I love to answer them. That's it, team, for another episode of the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Remember, I am inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum every day, answering your marketing questions on an ongoing basis. I reckon it's the 40, best 49 bucks you will ever spend on the marketing of your business. There's a great crew of people in there, all with the one intent of growing their business through great marketing, and we're helping each other day by day to do that. There's some great stories forming in there. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, click on the forum button, and you will be in there faster than you can say, how come I didn't get into the Small Business Big Marketing Forum quicker. Now, um, what else we got? Lots of big interviews coming up. If there's someone you would love me to interview, by all means, go over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and click on the Contact Us page. There is a little uh, field there where you can send me your interview suggestions. Hang around after the outro because I am going to share some list of testimonials and reviews. But until then, may your marketing be the best marketing See you later. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reed. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. G'day, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Rodney Holder, and I produce an educational music business podcast called Music Business Facts. My podcast has recently been featured on the new and noteworthy section on the Australian iTunes Store, and I'd like to give a big shout-out to Tim Reed for helping me achieve this little but exciting milestone. I first discovered Tim's awesome podcast, Small Business Big Marketing, quite a few years ago, and it has consistently delivered quality and cutting-edge business and marketing information, delivered in an entertaining and often humorous manner. I then followed Tim over to his other podcast with James Shramko called Freedom Ocean, where I was consistently blown away by the incredible online business information freely and regularly given away. So thanks again, Tim, for helping me achieve this small milestone with my own podcast. You've been an inspiration and a mentor, mate. I strongly advise anyone who is interested in both traditional and online marketing look into Tim Reed's quality products and services. I promise you'll learn a lot. So this is Rodney Holder from Music Business Facts, signing off. Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com